Another working day began at the furniture factory. Workers in the workshops were making pieces of furniture, assembling sofas and beds, and every worker was doing their job. A young cleaning lady, Maria, also worked. She cleaned the office premises, and to make it more fun, she listened to her favorite music in her headphones. She didn't even notice that she started humming the melody out loud. She was singing really great, no worse than a professional singer. Maria's colleagues listened to her voice with admiration. And only the chief economist, annoying Eleonora, irritably threw the papers on the table and walked up to the cleaning lady, pulling her by the arm. Maria even shrieked in surprise, immediately removed her headphones and looked at her with surprise. Eleonora yelled at the cleaning lady, What the hell are you doing? We're not in a theater, and there's no need to perform a show here. You'd better do your job and don't open your mouth unless someone asks you to. Maria suddenly realized that she had been singing out loud. The girl apologized and continued working. However, Eleonora could not calm down. She followed Maria around and forced her to mop the floor in her office twice. It was so humiliating. The girl wanted to tell Elena everything she thought, but she stopped herself and kept silent. Maria kept telling herself, Well, that's okay. I'll save up some money and go to a professional singing college. I'm gonna be famous, and you're gonna hear my voice everywhere. Eleonora, she finally finished her work and came home. Her little kitten Winston was already at the door. She had found him recently near the garbage cans. Someone had kicked him out, and his leg was broken. He squeaked miserably and called for help. The girl couldn't stand it and took the kitten home, but she was risking a lot because the landlady forbade Maria to have pets there. Maria took the kitten to the vet, paying the last of her money for the appointment. They put a plaster cast on the kitten's leg and prescribed a lot of medications because the poor animal was in a very bad condition. Maria cured the kitten, and he was in a cast for three weeks. Winston was very devoted to his kind owner and always waited patiently for her from work on the carpet in the hallway. As soon as Maria came in, he immediately pressed his furry body against her and wagged his tail almost like a dog. At such moments, Maria felt so good, so warm, all her hard feelings evaporated, and a smile came back on her face. And today, the kitten quickly calmed down the girl. Maria decided to call her mother and dialed her phone number. Hi, mom. How are you doing? How's your health? Stephanie replied. Sweetie, I'm so glad you called me. I'm fine. Don't worry. Except Luna got sick. I had to call the vet. How are you? Do you like your new job? Is everything okay? I'm so worried about you. How are you coping with everything alone in a huge city? Mom, I'm doing great. Don't worry. And I'm not alone. Winston is with me. He's so funny. He's waiting for me at home every day. When I have a vacation, I'll visit you right away and help with the household. After talking to her mom, Maria thought about her challenging childhood. Maria grew up in a small town. Her mother worked on a farm, and her stepfather cultivated potatoes. They had always taught Maria to work hard and didn't spoil her. The girl didn't want to upset her mother and stepfather, so she helped them with housework and in the field and studied quite well. But in fact, she hated it all. It seemed terrible to her to spend her whole life like that because her parents were working all the time without any rest. Her mother always came home exhausted, stroking her beloved daughter's hair. The girl adored her mother. The woman was great at singing. Their neighbors even invited her to various weddings and celebrations. Stephanie was also very attractive, except for that ugly scar from her ear and almost all over her neck. Her mother was always stressed about it, and she always wore wide shawls trying to hide that scar somehow. Maria tried to find out how she got that scar, but her mother hated such questions, so she immediately changed the topic of the conversation. She didn't want to think about anything bad. Maria didn't know who her father was, and her mom never told her anything about him. When Maria was a child, 
Her mom met Jack, and he moved in with them. He wasn't a bad man. He worked hard and never hurt Maria, but he was in no hurry to consider himself her father. There was always some distance between them, a slight indifference. Apparently, he was never able to love Maria as his own daughter. Jack was a stern man. He was the one who solved all the problems and distributed the money in the family budget. He brought up Maria strictly, demanded to study diligently, didn't allow her to go out late, and instilled in the girl respect for elders. But he never spared money for her. He bought her clothes, a cell phone and toys. But there was no real love between them. The girl obeyed her stepfather and respected him. But she lacked fatherly love. Maria dreamed of entering the vocal department of the university. She was great at singing, like her mother. And she used to perform at festivals and even go to various competitions. She always imagined herself standing on a big stage in the spotlight, and everyone applauded her. But her stepfather and mother didn't understand her passion. Therefore, when Maria once told her parents about her cherished desire, there was a scandal in the house. Jack said sternly, Stephanie, you spoiled your daughter. She doesn't know anything about life. Singing. Seriously. How can she make money out of it? She should get a normal profession. Maria, you like math, don't you? So you'll study at the University of Economics, period. I won't give you money for such nonsense. Maria was crying and trying to argue. Mom, Jack, I don't want to study at the University of Economics. It's boring. I want to sing. Why don't you understand me? Her mother only sighed and lowered her eyes. Jack was a strict and stubborn man and it was useless to argue with him. But at the same time, the woman realized that her husband was right. Her daughter would never become a famous singer, and she would only waste her time. Her stepfather was saving money for university, as promised, and Maria was depressed, waiting to be accepted to a university she didn't like. She really didn't want it. Although she had excellent knowledge of math, she didn't want to spend the rest of her life working as an accountant or economist every day. The farmer's son, Greg, liked Maria very much. But the girl couldn't stand him. He was insolent, arrogant, liked to drink alcohol, and he was ugly. She tried to avoid him, but he followed her everywhere, not suggesting a relationship, but literally threatening her. Maria, you will be mine anyway. My parents have already made an agreement with your stepfather. We will get married, and they will unite their lands and increase their income. So, the deal is already made. The girl was angry and answered him sharply. Don't lie. My parents wouldn't do that. And why do you even need me? I don't even love you. How are we going to live together? Greg laughed. Who told you we're going to live together right away? First. I'm going to have some fun with you, to enjoy your young body, and then I'll decide if we're gonna live together. Maria cried and begged her parents. I'm not going to marry Greg. Jack, I agree to study at the University of Economics. Just don't force me to marry Greg. You said yourself that I'll go to university first. But her stepfather rubbed his hands together and said, Silly girl, try to see your own benefits. Greg is a nice guy, and I'm not saying you have to get married tomorrow. You'll be engaged for a while. The main thing is to merge the business with the farmer. You will graduate, get married. Greg's father will give you a job as an accountant and will have a much bigger income. Don't complain, think twice, and be smart. Greg may be stupid, but his parents are wealthy, so you'll live a comfortable life, I'm sure. You'll thank me later. Maria cried and screamed. Why don't you even try to understand me? I don't like Greg. He is disgusting. Are we in the 17th century? Why don't you tie me up and force me into marriage? Her mom understood everything, felt sorry for her daughter, and tried to comfort her. Maria, don't get upset. You still need to finish studying. We'll see how things will turn out later. We're not saying that you have to get married tomorrow, but at least try to look at him from a different angle. Maybe he is not that bad. 
Where will you find a better husband in our town? We only want what's best for you, Maria objected. I'm not going to live here, and I don't need this stupid Greg. I'm going to leave this damn town and live the way I want, and love who I want. Meanwhile, the farmer's son was stalking Maria, brazenly harassing her. He acted like she was his property. Maria was on the verge of despair and dreamed of leaving for the big city, mentally hoping that while she was studying at the university, Greg would forget about her. She knew that she would never marry Greg, but when Maria was in her final year of high school, everything changed dramatically. Jack suddenly became ill. He had a constant headache, didn't want to eat, became pale, and it was hard for him to do his favorite job because he had no energy. Maria's mother urged him to go to the doctor, but Jack told her it was just fatigue. The man's condition worsened rapidly, and when they finally went to the doctor, it was too late. He was diagnosed with a terminal stage of cancer. The man died six months later. Maria's mother cried and longed for her husband, and she didn't know how she would live without him. Maria also cried. She felt sorry for her stepfather and her mother. How would she stay here alone? Almost all the money Jack was saving for his stepdaughter's university education was spent on his treatment and funeral. So now the family had no money at all. But despite all the problems, the girl realized that now she could organize her life the way she wanted. And no one would force her to marry the disgusting Greg. After the prom, Maria began to persuade her mother. Mom, I'm going to go to the city. I've already checked what papers I need to apply to the university. And I'll get a dormitory room there. Let me go. Please. It's my biggest dream. I don't want to be an accountant. I will suffer all my life if I become an accountant. Besides, it's hard for you to cope with everything without Jack. And now you don't really have enough money for both of us. But if I go to the city, I'll get a job there and I'll support you. The woman hugged her beloved daughter and said, Well, how can I dissuade you? I know how much you want to sing. I used to be like that myself. And I believed in my happy future but things didn't turn out the way I wanted them to. That's why I'm talking you out of it. I'm worried about you, and I don't want you to repeat my mistakes. But on the other hand, I realize how important it is for you, and it would be wrong if I deprive you of the chance to be happy. If you've made up your mind, go. Just don't forget me, and call me regularly. Maria shrieked with joy. Thank you, mommy. I knew you would understand and support me. I'll go pack my bags. Believe in me. You will be proud of your daughter. I promise. The goodbye was very sad. Stephanie cried and hugged her only daughter. She was anxious. How would Maria survive alone in a big city? There were no relatives or friends there. She whispered to her daughter. Maria, no matter what, remember that if anything happens, go home. I will always be waiting for you. Maria was so happy. It seemed to her that the train was taking her to a happy future, away from her boring hometown. And now everything would be fine. She was very confident because all the judges at the singing competitions told her that she sang better than everyone else. When she arrived, she rented a small room and without even unpacking, went to the university. But no matter how hard she tried during the exam, the tutors were not satisfied with Maria's singing. They advised her to prepare for the exam and come back another time if she really wanted to study here. In the corridor, listening to other people's conversations, she realized that all the students had paid bribes to enter this university, and without money, they would not accept her. Maria was upset. What should I do now? Go home. Everyone will mock me. And mom will be frustrated. No, it's okay, I'll get a job, work for a year, save up some money, and enter this university anyway. There's no way I'm giving up my dream. She wiped her tears and went home, but she was not going to give up. After all, she had been dreaming about it for so many years. The girl started to look for a job, but it turned out that Jack was right. No one was willing to hire her without education or work experience and she barely managed to get a job as a cleaner in a furniture factory. That's how Maria's hard life began. 
The amount of work was enormous. The salary was miserable. And the angry boss Eleonora constantly yelled at her. But the CEO, Max, on the contrary, was a very nice and polite man. Always said hello to Maria and could even chat with her. Colleagues told her that he was 45 years old widower, raising a three-year-old son alone. His wife died in childbirth. They described him as a fair and loyal manager. Maria liked him very much. He was tall, handsome, and had deep green eyes. One day, Maria was cleaning the second floor and happened to hear a conversation in Eleonora's office. She had a conversation with Brenda, the accountant. Eleonora said, listen, there's something I want to do. In a couple of days, the CEO is going to sign a contract for purchasing expensive materials for the beds. The delegation has already arrived. I told Max that although the material is much more expensive, it's many times better. And he believed me. I've prepared the contract. If you check it out, you'll understand everything. It's an unreliable company and the deal is doomed to fail. In fact, it's the cheapest and the worst wood. Anyway, I want our CEO to go bankrupt. Brenda, please help me to do that. My competitors have promised me a good position in their company if I do what they want. I'll help you to get a job there too, but not as a simple accountant, but as a chief economist. You'll get a salary three times what you get here. Brenda was hesitant, I'm afraid. Eleonora, what if it doesn't work out, or the CEO finds out? Then we'll lose our job. But Eleonora insisted, don't worry, we have to take the risk. Max trusts me, he'll sign all the documents without even checking it. Eventually, Brenda agreed, but they had no idea that Maria had heard their entire conversation. Trying not to make too much noise, she stepped aside so as not to attract unnecessary attention. Everything inside her was burning with anger. What a horror. I have to warn Max, even if he doesn't believe me. Maria didn't risk going to the CEO's office right away. She waited for him after work in the parking lot. Maria approached the man and started timidly. Max, I'm sorry. I know the work day is over, but I need to talk to you. I have to warn you. Eleonora and Brenda are trying to set you up. I overheard their conversation by accident, and she revealed the cunning plan of their colleagues. Max clenched his fists, turned pale, and quietly said, I get it. Thank you, Maria. You're saving my company right now. I don't know how to thank you. If you need any help, just tell me. I'll do anything for you. The day of the deal had come. Everyone in the company was excited. There were representatives of another company and all the bosses of the furniture factory in the office. When the documents were already on the table, Eleonora kindly handed a pen to the CEO, saying, no need to check the contract. This is a reliable company, and the deal is very profitable. Our beds will be more sturdy now, and the design will change. We will earn a lot of money. Max looked at Eleonora and was shocked by her brazenness. He calmly took some papers out of the folder and threw them on the table. I can only trust myself. So I double-checked everything myself. It turned out that the company supplying this material doesn't exist officially. I did a spectral analysis of the material, and it does not correspond to the declared parameters at all. They wanted to deceive me. This is a contract worth tens of thousands of dollars. How do you explain that? Eleonora, you said you checked everything yourself. The accountant must be blind, too. She should have verified the validity of the information. I trusted you, Eleonora. I'm grateful to someone who warned me in time. Otherwise, I'd be bankrupt for sure. Eleonora, Brenda, leave before I call the police. The CEO fired Eleonora and Brenda in front of all the employees and said, If anyone else wants to do something like this, you'd better quit right away. I don't want traitors in my company. Tell me, colleagues, have I ever hurt anyone? Or do you have a small salary? No, I pay decent salaries to all of you. Our company is developing dynamically, 
and I want my company to have only loyal people. Everyone looked at Eleonora disapprovingly and went to their workplaces. And the angry woman looked at Maria with hatred, realizing that she was the only one who could have reported everything to the CEO. Eleonora had a fight with Brenda as well because Brenda blamed her for their dismissal. Finally, Maria's life got better. She worked in peace and no one scolded her for trifles every day. One day, the CEO took his son Danny to work. He left him in his office and asked his assistant to keep an eye on him. He had another deal today and couldn't miss it. Maria was watering the flowers and heard that the boy was crying loudly. She approached him and saw that the frightened assistant was trying to comfort the child, but nothing was working. The boy was crying and calling for his daddy. Maria entered and timidly asked, Excuse me, can I try to calm the boy down? He probably wants to sleep. Besides, it's hot here, so we need to take his jacket official. Can I sing him a lullaby? Ms. Jones replied irritably, Sure, I don't mind. Just do something. I don't understand why Max hasn't hired a nanny yet. Maria sat down next to the child, took off his warm jacket, started stroking his head, and quietly sang a lullaby. Her voice was quiet and gentle, and the boy calmed down and began to fall asleep. The assistant was surprised and didn't know what to say. The CEO was standing outside the office at that moment and could not believe his ears. He could not take his eyes off the girl. Her lullaby reminded Max of the best time of his life. Max grew up in a poor dysfunctional family. His mother was an alcoholic, and he knew nothing about his father. The child grew up on his own, stayed outside until late at night because he didn't want to go home, and learned to fight early. There was never any normal food at home, and the constant smell of alcohol and tobacco made him sick to his stomach even when he grew up. Right after graduating from high school, the guy left for the big city, looking for a better life. He was lucky. Some rich family hired him. Max tried his best. He worked as a gardener and a janitor and helped with household chores. Carol, a wealthy businesswoman, was the owner of the house. She was strict and not very friendly, but she always paid him his salary on time. One day, her younger cousin came to visit her. The girl's name was Stephanie. She entered the University of Art and lived at her sister's house. Max fell in love with Stephanie at first sight. He still remembered her deep green eyes, slim body, and long blonde hair. He used to give her wild flowers, quietly placing them on her windowsill at night to please his beloved. Stephanie reciprocated him, and true love arose between them. Young couples went to the movies, strolled along the night city, and could not imagine life without each other. They kept their relationship a secret, but Carol and her husband found out about it. Stephanie confessed to them that she had fallen in love seriously and that she and Max wanted to get married. Such a turn of events didn't suit the business lady. She didn't want this poor gardener to become her relative. What could he give Stephanie? Carol had already found a promising man for her sister. He was her husband's relative. She tried to separate the couple, making scandals, not allowing Stephanie to go on dates, and threatening the gardener with dismissal. But they continued to secretly love each other. His beloved Stephanie used to sing that very lullaby to Max. The guy dreamed that he would save some money, and they would rent an apartment and get married. But one day, a tragedy happened that separated the lovers forever. Carol's husband was driving in the car with Stephanie. He picked her up from the university and was taking her home. Suddenly, a terrible car accident happened. They both died. This news shocked Max. He tried to go to the morgue, wanted to say goodbye to his beloved. But Carol stopped him and ordered strictly, Don't be hysterical. Don't make me nervous. And anyway, go home. You're fired. And I don't want to see you at the funeral. You're not even our relative. Max was inconsolable. He didn't understand why Carol was so cruel and wouldn't even let him say goodbye to his beloved. He packed his belongings and went home. Max could not forget his beloved for a long time, 
His love for Stephanie lived in his heart, no matter what. The guy got a job in a big company. And the CEO, a lonely and not very attractive lady, Kate, noticed him. She was older than him, a little overweight, and didn't get much attention from men. She was the one who had initiated their relationship. At first, Kate made friends with him. They talked a lot about life. The woman learned about the difficult fate of this modest guy, felt sorry for him, and even helped him to enter the University of Economics. Max was very grateful to her. He saw how she looked at him. There was sincere love and hope in her eyes. Kate also told about herself, about her difficult fate, that she had to achieve everything on her own. One day, a woman asked him to fix a faucet in her house. Then they had a bottle of red wine, and Max stayed with her until morning. After that night, everything changed. They started dating officially. Kate was happy, for she was finally not alone and truly loved her fiancé. Soon Max married her, out of desperation and without much love. He convinced himself that he could fall in love with Kate and make her happy. But at that time his career began to improve. He and his wife opened their own business and moved to another city. His wife patiently taught Max how to run the business, and soon he was easily running the company together with his wife. Max respected his wife, was a faithful husband, and never cheated on her, but he was never able to love her. His love for Stephanie still lived in his heart. Only their business united them all this time, and only when Kate was already 40 years old, she suddenly got pregnant. It was a real miracle because Kate was sure she could not have babies. The couple were overjoyed, although the pregnancy was very difficult. Kate had terrible morning sickness and high blood pressure. Doctors tried to dissuade Kate from giving birth on her own. They insisted on a planned surgery, but the woman refused bravely endured everything and rejoiced that she would become a mother and give Max an heir. Suddenly, the worst fears of the doctors came true. The labor was long and difficult and ended tragically. The mother died of severe bleeding. Only her newborn son was saved. Max didn't understand why the Lord took away his loved one for the second time. Why? His son had become his only reason to live. The business required his constant presence. It was impossible to run it remotely. Max's mother died long ago. Kate had no relatives left, and Max started looking for a nanny for his son. But all the nannies quit after a week in his house, probably because he installed cameras everywhere and watched the footage every day to make sure the candidates were taking proper care of the baby. He was very worried about Danny and didn't want any nanny to hurt his baby. It became clear that the staff were negligent in their duties. When Danny went to kindergarten, things got a little easier for Max, but he still needed a nanny to take care of his son while Max was at work. Today he had to take the boy to work because another nanny got sick and forgot to inform him about it. Maria noticed the CEO and felt embarrassed and started making excuses. Max, excuse me, I only wanted to help you because your son was crying so loudly. I'm already leaving. I'm sorry. The CEO gestured for the assistant to leave, closed the door, and asked Maria, I'm not angry at all. On the contrary, I'm grateful to you for comforting my son. But tell me, how do you know this lullaby? It's not that popular. By the way, you have such a wonderful voice. The girl replied, my mother is great at singing. She always sang this lullaby to me when I was a kid. Max shuddered. Mom, what's your mom's name? Show me a picture of her, I beg you. It's very important to me. Maria was confused by such behavior, but answered him. My mom's name is Stephanie. Her picture is in my purse. I always have it with me. I'll bring it right away. While Maria went to get her purse, Max thought frantically, is that really my Stephanie? Is she alive? But how is that possible? She died in that accident. I would do anything to see her again. Maria brought the picture and handed it to the CEO. He whispered like a madman. That's her. That's my Stephanie. It's definitely her. I've found her. Stephanie, my love. Maria looked at him in shock 
and thought he had lost his mind. She handed him a glass of water. He drank it in a gulp, and then suddenly looked at Maria intently and started saying strange things. You are my daughter. Unbelievable. The man led her to a mirror on the wall, stood next to her, and started shouting, Right. You and I look so much alike. Maria stepped back to the door and asked, Max, are you all right? What are you talking about? Should I call an ambulance? The CEO ran up to Maria again, grabbed her hands, and told her, No, Maria, I'm not crazy. Please take a seat and listen to me. Don't interrupt me. It's a long story, but you'll understand everything. And he began to tell her about his whole life. Maria listened in shock, but believed him. Now she realized how her mom had gotten that scar on her neck and why she didn't want to talk about it. The CEO said sincerely, Maria, I thought Stephanie died in that accident. I didn't even know she was pregnant. I need to see her, please. Maria nodded and couldn't believe it all. And then she said, don't worry, we can go to my hometown anytime. My mom is at home, she's working on the farm. But I can't believe you're my father, though if it's true, I would be happy. I could only dream of such an honest and kind father. Max exclaimed, I beg you, let's not wait. Let's go to her as soon as Danny wakes up. I can't wait to see your mom, to talk to her. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen her for so many years. Stephanie was in the kitchen when she suddenly heard a knock on the window. The woman shuddered and went to open it. She saw her daughter, a man with a beard, and a baby in his arms. Stephanie was shocked. Sweetie, I'm so glad you came. Why didn't you tell me that you're not alone, but with guests? Will you introduce us? There was an awkward pause. Maria didn't know what to say. But then the man couldn't stand it and said, Stephanie, darling, don't you recognize me? It's me, Max. We loved each other. I was your cousin's gardener. The woman couldn't believe it. It was really Max, and he still had the same kind eyes, the same voice, and the same strong arms. But at the same time, he was different. Now the former shy gardener had a trendy hairstyle, an expensive suit, and a confident gaze. A woman's whole life suddenly flashed before her eyes, and her heart pounded harder. The man looked at her like before, with tenderness and love, he didn't notice any scars or wrinkles on her face. He saw the Stephanie he had loved all his life. Maria carefully took Danny in her arms and left. She realized that her mother and Max had a lot to talk about. She took the boy to the kitchen, fed him, and told him fairy tales. Maria liked spending time with this boy. She looked at him and thought, it would be nice if Danny turned out to be my brother. He's so cute. At this time, Max was questioning Stephanie. Tell me, what happened to you? How did you survive? Carol told me that you and her husband died in a car accident. Why didn't you tell me you were alive? Is Maria my daughter? Why did you hide it? Don't I have the right to know? Oh, Lord, what have we done? Stephanie told Max everything that had happened back then. My cousin's husband and I really got into a car accident. But I woke up in the hospital, in the intensive care unit. I didn't remember anything but the accident itself. Apparently, I had lost consciousness from shock. When I saw myself in the mirror, I screamed with horror. Part of my face, neck, and back were burned. Then I had endless surgeries, but this ugly scar remained for the rest of my life, just like a lot of pain and fear. Of course, I asked Carol about you. I missed you. I hoped you would come and be by my side. I missed you so much. But my cousin told me that you abandoned me and moved somewhere. I was so angry. And I hated you. The doctors said that I was pregnant. And it was a miracle that I didn't lose my baby after the accident and surgeries. When my cousin found out I was pregnant, she insisted that I have to terminate the pregnancy. But I couldn't do that. If the baby survived after everything that happened, that was my destiny. I dropped out of university and came back to my hometown. After Maria was born, 
My parents persuaded me to marry Jack. He was always in love with me. When he found out that I came back, he came to me. He didn't talk about love. He just proposed marriage. He said that even though he was angry with me, he couldn't live with anyone else. Even my scars didn't stop him. It really was a good option. We lived together for many years, but he died recently. Jack didn't abuse Mary, but he didn't love her. I know he tried to love her, but he couldn't. I did my best to be a good wife. I was grateful to him, but I couldn't fall in love with Jack. Max kept telling her, Stephanie, honey, it's a lie. Your cousin deceived me. When I found out about the tragedy, I almost went crazy. I wanted to go to the morgue and to the cemetery to say goodbye, but she forbade me and kicked me out. I was sure you were dead. I never forgot about you, about our love. Do you believe me? The woman suddenly asked, this boy, Danny, is he your son? Are you married? Tell me the truth, I'll understand. After all, so many years have passed. Max sighed and answered, my wife died in childbirth and now I'm raising Danny alone. Our fates are so similar. I couldn't make Kate happy either, because I only loved you, and she sensed it. So, Maria is my daughter, and Danny is her brother. Stephanie, I want you to know that I have found you, and I'm not letting you go anywhere. I'll take you away from here, and we'll get married. I've never loved anyone as much as I love you, and I don't want anyone else. Do you believe me? Stephanie cried and whispered. I can't believe this is happening to me. Max, my love, everything will be all right now. I know it for sure. I'll love your son, and I'll be the best mom for him. But please don't disappear again. I will not survive the separation one more time. Stephanie and Max peeked into the kitchen and watched Maria playing with Danny. Max called out to her softly. Maria, daughter, can I call you that from now on? I'm sorry that I wasn't there for you, that I missed all the important moments of your childhood. I can't change our past. I'm sorry. But we have our whole lives ahead of us. Let's try to become a family. I realize it won't be easy for both of us, and yet, I want you to trust me and to become your best friend. After all, you're my child too just like Danny. Maria couldn't stand it and hugged her father. I agree. Daddy, let's give it a try. And I already love my little brother. He's so cute. I am glad you and mom found each other and I wish you happiness. From that day on, their lives changed dramatically. Maria no longer worked as a cleaner. Her dad helped her to fulfill her cherished dream and she enrolled in the vocal department of the best university. Maria and Stephanie moved into Max's mansion. Now, they have become a real family. Max persuaded Stephanie to have another surgery at a private clinic, and her scar, which she had hated so much all her life, became almost invisible. At the end of the year, Maria was invited to a singing contest as the best student. It was very important for her. The girl prepared for a long time and decided to perform a difficult vocal composition. Eleonora, who had been fired from Max's company, had been following the cleaning lady's fate closely all this time. And, of course, she knew about everything that had happened to her. When Eleonora saw Maria's name among the contestants, she was glad that now she had a chance to take revenge on Maria. She came up with a cunning plan to ruin Maria's performance. She wanted them to call Maria untalented and kick her out of the contest. Finally, the day of the competition came. The dearest people came to support Maria. Mom and Dad were sitting in the front row and praying that their daughter would win. Maria looked stunning in a long dress. Her blonde curls covered her delicate shoulders and light makeup emphasized her natural beauty. The music started playing. Maria sang the first verse but suddenly the microphone cut off and the sound completely disappeared. The girl was so confused that she just stood there with her mouth open. And then Stephanie stood up from her seat and shouted, Maria, sweetheart, sing without a microphone. You can do it. Maria, feeling her mom's support, started singing louder and even better. 
All the people applauded her, and she kept singing, not looking at anyone. Her dad shouted loudly, Daughter, you're doing great. I'm proud of you. It was a success. The judges were impressed by the contestant, and Maria won the contest. Everyone congratulated her and took pictures. Her parents hugged and kissed her. Only Eleonora was furious. I hate her so much. Things were getting worse for this woman. Of course, Max's competitors didn't hire her. In fact, they weren't even going to hire her. They just wanted to use her. The debt collectors followed her everywhere. She even lost her apartment because of her debts. She looked for a job desperately. But Max made sure that no one would hire her after everything she did. The woman started drinking alcohol more and more often, cursing her former boss and that cleaning lady who had ruined such a good plan. Her life was rapidly getting worse, but Eleonora didn't realize the main thing. It was her own fault, but Maria was doing well. She had time to study and sing at concerts, and her personal life had also improved. One handsome guy came to all her performances. He always sat in the front row, applauded, and gave the girl beautiful bouquets. And one day he dared to talk to her. Maria, you are so talented. You sing like a goddess. May I invite you to dinner? I beg you, don't refuse me. The girl was intrigued and agreed to go out with him. The guy's name was Oliver, and he had already graduated from law school. Oliver accidentally saw Maria on TV and fell in love so much that all he could think about was meeting this gorgeous girl. Maria and Oliver were so different, and yet they complemented each other perfectly. Now, love inspired Maria, and her songs became even more sensual and sincere. All her cherished dreams have come true. Mom and Dad have found each other and were living happily together. She finally became a real singer, but most importantly, she met Oliver. They loved each other sincerely and already planned a wedding. Stephanie still couldn't believe what was happening to her. She had lived her whole life in a small town and had never seen anything but exhausting labor. Now she felt as if her life had begun all over again. Max had become her whole world. They cherished every minute they spent together. Max hired Stephanie in his company. They lived together, planned their future together, and most importantly, they never stopped loving each other. Little Danny gradually got used to Stephanie and sincerely loved her. At first, it was hard for the woman to cope with the child, to take care of him, but soon she fell in love with the little boy and began to call him her son. Maria and Oliver often came to visit them. They talked over dinner, played with little Danny, and had fun. Maria often sat with her mom in the kitchen and thought that life was interesting and unpredictable. A simple lullaby helped a family reunite. 